And I want to provide the board with an update on where we are as a district in creating our reopening plans. Uh, for our ninth grade cramps who may be listening and who are new to our district, I first want to start where it all began. Um, and um, that was last February during what is what we call as uh, pre-COVID. When the news came out about the virus spreading, our district looked uh, to take very swift measures on making sure we would keep our staff and students safe. And some of the measures we took were encouraging parents to keep sick kids home by educating the school community on the signs and symptoms of COVID-19. We waived things like uh, attendance to count against perfect attendance. Um, we canceled trips to hot spots like New York City, for example. And then we started canceling uh, trips altogether as hot spots were getting closer to home. We eliminated outside visitors from attending our facilities and we closed our facilities after school to outside groups. We spent a week in March preparing for an eventual shutdown and that is when our faculty really outshined themselves. They learned new technology, taught each other new technology and prepared their students. And when students left us on March 12th, they knew how instruction was going to continue and how they were going to be fed school lunches and the event will be closed. Then on March 13th, as a county, the superintendents in Burlington County closed all in-person school and the governor later closed schools the following week. And that is how we finished the school year as 100% remote instruction. And even now during our summer programs, the remote instruction remains. Now, while we're finishing the school year behind the scenes, we were brainstorming what September would look like. Operation Open LRHSD started with a central office staff committee where we combed over other states' reentry plans to try and envision what our plans should have in them. We also met with our respective counterparts throughout the county to share our ideas. For me, the meetings with other superintendents each Friday in the county uh, every morning were really invaluable and continue to be so. Finally, as soon as Diploma to Door was finished, in fact, the very next day, we broadened our committee to involve first the building principals and then staff from throughout the district. We also started surveying students and staff and parents. We waited and we waited for guidance from the Department of Education, which finally arrived on Friday, June 26th. And it was clear from the governor's address that districts needed to develop plans to reopen schools with a few measures. Um, and some of those mandates include, um, first, there needs to be an in-person component to our reopening plans. And all parents need to know what our plans are at least four weeks before the first day of school. And with these guidelines, instead of clarity and specificity, <laughs> uh, they contradicted many of the other executive orders in place, um, putting superintendents in what a lot of people called a lose-lose situation. Um, things like not requiring masks for everyone in the building made it hard to reconcile what we were seeing from other executive orders and other requirements for other establishments, including the latest requiring masks outdoors. As this one article pointed out, there's a lot on the shoulders of school officials where we're going to have to tow a stricter line than the minimum requirements and the guidance to ensure everyone is safe in our schools. But my point in telling you all this is not to garner empathy for superintendents in the state. It's to have empathy really uh, for the parents and students and staff who may be confused by all of the contradicting information and may be a little scared about in-person instruction. That's the point of this presentation, to shed light on the activities that our district has been, engaged, has been engaged in since March in anticipation for this very same mandate to open schools and to let the staff and students and parents know that we will plan to reopen after we have considered all of the health and safety parameters. So the main task for Operation Open LRHSD is to develop plans to reopen our schools with consideration for student and staff safety, wellness, and continuity of academic programs with one main rule that educational health will not come at the expense of everyone's health. And while we plan for some form of in-person instruction, because that is the mandate of the hour, and that's because New Jersey's numbers have shown improvement, we know the nation's numbers of positive cases are not dropping and surging in many places. And we realize that all of the plans we will create might not see implementation in September. That is why I've consistently communicated throughout this process, we need to have the proper mindset to turn on a dime. 
to expect a complete shutdown any day. Our students and staff and parents need to be prepared for just that. Flexibility is the key and the intelligence needed to master flexibility is really innate in each of us and we just have to be prepared. We are going to be prepared for all scenarios come September by tapping on the strength of our school community. We created six steering committees. Chris Callanan and Amanda Castle are the chairpersons for the safety and physical mental health committee. Heather Zanakis and Shannon Bretz chair curriculum and instruction. Paige McGregor and Ryan DiVitale chair the personnel committee. Jeff Spector and PJ Megan chair the athletics and activities committee. Connie Stewart and Matt Webb chair finance and operations. And our facilities, transportation and meals committee is chaired by Tony Borough and Kara Huber. These advisory committees will set guidelines by the end of July and then hand them off to the building principals to form school-based committees that plan to implement those guidelines in their schools. Because as everyone knows, each school has things that are unique to just those schools. So the committees will be setting guidelines, but not exactly rules and mandates for each individual school. For example, uh, one committee may be saying that we need a quarantine room, but they're not gonna dictate where that quarantine room specifically is gonna be in Senegal School. Um, our committees have many resources available to them. Um, first, they have the Department of Education's document that they released on June 26 called The Road Back, all 104 pages of it. Um, if it's not posted on our website, we will certainly post it on our website for anyone in our community to review. Um, they also have uh, their credentials and knowledge of our students and staff and communities. I really just wanna take a moment and pause about um, and then later on, I'll show who are exactly in our committees. But here is, here are the types of jobs um, that our committee members hold within our district and even beyond. Um, we, we are representing every single group um, in our school district, and we're even uh, we've even enlisted uh, two district physicians, Drs. Holton and Dr. Hickey, to be a part of our committee. Um, and all of these members have a vast um, institutional knowledge of our school district, but they're also gonna be armed with other knowledge about our school district through our survey process. We already um, instituted three surveys. The first one was to review our spring virtual instruction program. And then the last two were how to measure um, exactly who was gonna be returning to school uh, once and if it opens. So I'd like to review um, for our spring virtual instruction program. You know, while we're planning for in-person instruction, it will be at best a hybrid program where there will be an online component. component. And let's not forget that any day uh, could be the first day of 100% virtual instruction again. So we know we worked really hard last spring to deliver an online school program at a moment's notice. And I know it was really good, but now we have time to plan and how can we make it better? And where do our parents and students feel it needs to be made better? So we surveyed all of our parents and our students in grades nine through 12. We received close to 5,000 responses. And as you can see, mostly represented by grades nine through 11, but we are really grateful for the vast number of seniors and their parents who also wanted to help us improve our online programming for the next generation of students. Our high schoolers had an excellent display of adaptability and could navigate Google Classroom and upload assignments for their teachers to provide feedback with ease. Parents and students uh, reported that 35% of our students were engaged in schoolwork for more than four hours a day. About half reported they worked between two and four hours a day and a smaller percentage, percentage worked less than two hours a day. Moving forward, 100% virtual program will need to have a more defined time on task and expectation for face-to-face -face instruction. Parents were split here. Uh, half felt the early start time was good for their child, yet half said it was too early. But as anyone could predict, and we probably didn't need a survey for this, uh, most students felt the remote school day should start a little later. Internet connectivity results were consistent with our pre-COVID survey as we were preparing for emergency preparedness plans for academic continuity last spring. To assist families, our district provided information on the discounted rate from Comcast, which they made available due to the global pandemic. 
and we provided hotspots to families who could, who could not get internet access. Over 80% of our parents said virtual instruction did not negatively impact their child's ability to learn. However, we're concerned that close to 40% of our students felt virtual school learning negatively impacted their ability to learn. And we'll see on these next slides what they report as the possible causes that impacted their ability to learn in a virtual environment. Of the parents who reported their child's ability to learn was negatively impacted, they felt their child did not have enough teacher interaction. They also noted a lack of motivation um, was an obstacle for success. Uh, teachers we know have a direct impact on our students' motivation, so it's not a surprise that motivation followed lack of teacher interaction for that percentage of parents who felt that their child's ability to learn was negatively impacted. Um, also, looks like the third one there is the use of multiple platforms. The teachers use different um, applications to reach their students and that could have been another obstacle to success. Students also noted their lack of motivation and wanting more live teacher interaction as their top two obstacles to success. And an almost identical percentage of over 80% of students and parents were either neutral, satisfied, or very satisfied with the overall spring remote learning program. So what that tells us that um, we know that Google Classroom usage was very easy for our student body. Over 80% over of our students were very satisfied with the programming. Um, but our next time through this, we need to go that, we, that we'll need to go 100% virtual, we'll need more live teacher interaction, which we know will improve motivation, more consistency with platforms, and perhaps start time for remote learning uh, was a little too early. So overall, I really do believe that our staff and students should be applauded for their abilities to adapt so quickly to the online environment, and it was really good but we know we can make it better by implementing a few of the suggestions from parents and students and by involving teachers on our committees right now. So next up, I wanna talk about our in-person planning and this shouldn't be challenging, right? Cause we've been doing in-person schooling forever. Uh, but just like I said, last spring was good, um, but virtual school is not real school. Our in-person schooling is not really gonna look like real school just yet either. Think of what we love about our schools, right? Community and collaboration and teamwork. And now all that's going to have to be accomplished through health screenings, uh, being six feet away and masks on everyone. So the mandate was to create a plan for in-person instruction. But before we could do that, we need to see if our staff and students would plan on attending. Um, we received 1,049 responses from our staff and over 5,000 responses from parents. Basically, we just wanted to find out who's gonna be coming to school in September. Now we realize that this is just a snapshot in time and that answers we received then when we surveyed will change as the pandemic situation changes. But at the time of the survey, close to 80% of faculty say they plan on being physically present. 5% report they have health concerns and will need to instruct virtually. And there's a group of teachers who don't know what their little ones at home will be doing just yet to commit. From this, we can plan for in-person instruction and make room for staff who will need to instruct their students at home, even while some of their students will be in the building. Communication day to day is going to be key as we will get supervision for their students to log in to their devices and watch their teacher instruct from their home. Three quarters of our parents intend to send their kids to school at the time we surveyed them. And almost the same percentage, 5% have children with pre-existing health conditions that will need who will need complete virtual instruction. While many parents will need to see um, and measure the pandemic conditions and our plan before they decide to send their kids to school. From this, we know we will need to communicate with a lot of detail to help parents with their decision. And we'll have to plan for some synchronous learning for the students who will not be able to be physically sitting in our classrooms, meaning they will need to be a part of the daily class, but via technology. Without putting any plan on paper yet, this is really not looking like school yet, as we know it. Also to further understand the transportation impact on students from our survey of parents, we know that only 40% of parents intend to use the school buses as their, uh, for their child to get to school. 
All the survey data um, was shared with our committees. And like I said earlier, I just wanted to at least um, provide information on exactly who is participating on these committees. So here's our safety and physical mental health committee. And what they did is they actually reached out beyond their committee um, and, and enlisted consultants uh, to work in subcommittees with uh, committee leaders um, because they knew that there was areas that were not represented and they wanted to make sure they represented every single area. And again, this is the committee that um, has two doctors volunteering to sit on. Their task is to enlist a wide cross section of staff, which they've already done, and medical professional expertise to develop safety and wellness recommendations for the reopening of schools. They will be making recommendations on mask requirements, health screenings and temperature checks, traffic flow in the hallways and stairways, uh, training about COVID-19 and personal health, uh, role of the nurse, wellness, mental health check-ins by faculty, and much more. Well, we have a very large curriculum and instruction committee, and it's because they have a very large task in front of them. Well over 30 members make up the curriculum instruction committee chaired by Heather Zanakis and Shannon Bretz. And their job is to create a schedule um, and expectations which will build rapport with students, consider students' social, emotional concerns, and maximize the frequency of students in schools. This committee has a really big to-do list. They're going to be recommending an in-person daily student schedule. They'll be demonstrating what a 100% virtual schedule would look like. They'll be dividing students into cohorts, um, A, B days, expectations for virtual learning, accommodations for staff and students who need to stay at home, professional development programs, and resource guides for online learning for parents and students and staff and much more. Personnel committee chaired by Paige McGregor and Ryan DiNatale are uh, made up of representatives from all stakeholders throughout our school district. And their main task is to ensure staff and students' physical health and safety when looking at personnel concerns, prioritizing health and well being of staff and students above everything else. Look for recommendations on expectations in remote working, eligibility for leaves of, leaves of absences safety recommendations, collaboration with unions, and much more. Our athletics and activities is chaired by Jeff Spector and PJ Megan, and they broke their team up into three distinct categories, activities, athletics, and performing arts. Based on the current and evolving health and safety guidelines for their committees, uh, they will be defining the characteristics of a program which is going to be deemed either essential, modifiable, or challenging. Modifiable essential programs would be implemented while other programs would be very challenging to operate following social distancing. Look for recommendations on how equity and equal access must be ensured, how programs must meet social and emotional needs of students, creating definitions of the role of advisors and coaches in a range of environments, in person, online, and hybrid, and how programs will incorporate ninth graders uh, who are new to our school district on how to get involved. Our fifth committee is Finance and Operations and it's chaired by Matt Webb and Connie Stewart. And they have a to-do list which involves the need to establish expectations and protocols for recording student attendance in hybrid and virtual schools, recommend strategies to alleviate student traffic in, in school buildings, establish expectations and protocols for students wearing masks and staff interactions with students regarding students wearing masks, establish expectations and protocols for sick students, staff and health screenings, prioritize items that need to be purchased for COVID-19 related needs and create or revise many policies to address COVID-19 related needs. And last but certainly not least is our facilities, transportation and meals committee led by Kara Huber and Tony Voro. And really all eyes are on disinfecting. It seems to be the, the word of the day. Um, and so a lot rests on the uh, facilities people that support our facilities program. And of course, their main goal is to provide a healthy operating facility to ensure comfort for all students and staff as it relates to disinfecting and cleaning procedures while being open to positive dialogue to achieve this. In transportation, we need to establish procedures to transport students to and from school safely for both students and drivers. 
ensure safety of all drivers and students through proper disinfecting procedures and personal protective equipment. And we need to determine how to provide meals by ensuring all students who need meals are provided with them even during times when the child may not be in school by developing procedures to feed children based on our in-school schedule, which is going to be established, and by ensuring student safety during breakfast and lunch through the establishment of disinfecting procedures, use of PPE by staff, and adequate eating locations that allow for social distancing. So the schedule for students, and I think this visual really helps understand the range of what school could look like. Hopefully, we'll start the school year out in a hybrid situation that also provides options for those who need 100% remote and options for specialized populations of students who need in-person instruction every single day. It's a couple of things that need to happen to be fully open on the left-hand side there, right? Obviously, um, it'd be great if we had the whole COVID-19 pandemic thing behind us. Uh, that would certainly be a lot easier to say we can open up schools. We'd need the Department of Health's assurances. We'd need a vaccine or an executive order from the governor. Um, to have success in a 100% remote program or even in a hybrid program, every child needs a reliable device with a camera. And as a result, every student in LRHSD will be distributed a district-owned Chromebook before classes begin. Our curriculum and instruction committee is working hard at developing a schedule for hybrid learning. In fact, they presented about 17 different models and debated and deliberated each and every single one of them, trying to stay true to their goal of maximizing in-person time as much as possible in the beginning in the school year. Last spring when we shut down, we already established great rapport between staff and students. But if we're going to have a shutdown of schools in the fall, we need to build that face-to-face -face rapport as soon as possible and to the extent feasible. Here's what we can share now about the schedule. Uh, we will communicate the schedule by the second week in August upon review of the Operation Open LRGC Committee Chairs, focus groups, students, parents, and board committees. Uh, it will provide an A-B alternating day schedule based on alpha, meaning we'll have 50% of the students in the building each day. Uh, we will provide for 100% in-person instruction for certain self-contained classes or specialized programs. We'll allow for flexibility for those parents who cannot send their child to school for medical or other reasons due to COVID-19. And we'll provide that same flexibility for staff who cannot attend physical school for medical or other reasons due to COVID-19. What we don't know yet, as other committees are weighing in now on the committee's recommended schedule, is the length of each class or what classes we'll be meeting each day. We know that onboarding students due to health screenings, ensuring everyone is masked, and the likelihood of scanning for temperatures will take some time in the morning. What we also know is that there is no perfect schedule. The situation is not permanent and life will be normal one day. We just have to have patience, resiliency, and teamwork. And anytime we feel frustrated with the rules that are put upon us, I think we all just need to keep repeating this little mantra. There is no perfect, this is not permanent, and life will be normal one day. It will certainly help us and those around us be happier with this frustrating situation. So before I summarize the next steps, I just need to pause and thank the over 180 people working tirelessly this summer, volunteering to create the very best environment for our students and staff given the mandate to have in-person instruction. We all want kids back in school, but we want this in the safest possible way. And these volunteers are looking out for just that. Each of these committees should have their recommendations to me by the end of July. And in August, the principals will take over and lead building-based committees. So if we think back to the beginning of the presentation where the article called this situation a lose-lose situation, I'd like to predict that by August, we will be touted for our win-win situation because our plans are being built collaboratively. Our plans will consider safety above all else and will ensure equitable access to academic programming. But as we've come accustomed to, all plans that we will be producing will be living, breathing documents. We ask for everyone's patience, just as this week, we just heard the CDC is expected to give us revised recommendations for schools by the end of the week. 
and guidance from state health department on child care and camps is also being revised based on their early rollout this summer. And of course, we're all watching what is happening in the states other than New Jersey right now with their rising positive cases. So while we will be reopening and we're creating reopening plans and we plan for that to be September 8th uh, for reopening of in-person instruction. And if you remember what I said about being flexible, all of us parents, students, staff and community members are smart enough to know that the only constant in this pandemic is change. And we know that there will be things beyond our control that may delay our reopening. We will ensure our plans are able to smoothly transition us from hybrid to virtual, back to hybrid, and then one day, real school again. So I wanna thank, thank everybody, thank our committee members, and I wanna let everybody know we're gonna continue to keep our communication, um, our community informed throughout this process. 